on that note, before before things degenerate here and Deb starts telling stories about me, maybe maybe we ought to get started. Can you hear me and see the screen and all that? This is the last week of this series where we've been trying to define what biblical Christianity claims to be true and asking the question, uh, what evidence can it bring to bear to support those claims and how does it bear up against key objections? We've talked about other, other religions, we've talked about science, last week talked about the positive case and some of the issues with the Bible itself, given that it claims to be actual communication from the Creator. And uh, we're going to wrap up with what many have considered the greatest single objection against uh, the core ideas of biblical Christianity, which is often called the problem of evil. Evil, of course, is a problem in many respects, but there's a particular challenge for the claims of biblical Christianity, which says that there is an all-powerful, all-loving God. So we want to talk about that. I think it's sort of a, it's an interesting topic. It's at one level sort of philosophical and abstract, but I think it's deeply personal, deeply relevant, moment by moment as we as humans live our lives out. And I don't expect to answer every question, obviously, but I think there's some, some really wonderful things ultimately that I see in the biblical response to this challenge. So... What I want to do is start by getting just a little bit more of a bead of the problem. Uh, so, so here's an interesting quote from Charles Darwin talking about one category of these sorts of things, which is the way nature works. And he's writing to his friend and he says, There seems to me too much misery in the world. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the ichneumonidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars, or that a cat should play with mice. Not believing this, I see no necessity in the belief that the eye was expressly designed. So there's a few things going on in this quote that these wasps hunt around and they find a caterpillar and they inject their um, eggs into the caterpillar as they hatch, they eat it from the inside out and finally carve their way out and go on about their own life cycles. And the, the cat and the mice thing actually is more powerful for me. Carnivorality uh, is just, you know, really raises questions. Is this the kind of natural system that the God described in the Bible would really bring into existence? But as much as some of these things are troubling... I think much more so the things that humans have done to each other and are doing to each other down through human history. Felt the need to pick one example uh, to remind us of how deep some of this stuff goes. This is from some uh, humanitarians who are helping refugees from Saddam Hussein's regime. And in an interview with them, there was a machine designed for shredding plastic. Men were dropped into it and we were again made to watch. Sometimes they went in head first and died quickly. Sometimes they went in feet first and died screaming. It was horrible. I saw 30 people die like this. Their remains would be placed in plastic bags and we were told that they would be used as fish food. Women were suspended by their hair as their family watched. Men were forced to watch as their wives were raped. Women were suspended by their legs while they were menstruating until their periods were over, a procedure designed to cause humiliation. The thing is, if you uh, are much of a student of history, you realize that you could literally grab into almost any time and almost any place and find incidents that are on par with this. You know, some of the things I've read about the history of, of our own uh, region here in Ohio what would keep you up at night, just if you think about them. And, and then apart from these sort of horrific large-scale things that have gone on, there's the, the medium level and small level things, you know, the fracturing of family relationships and the fallout from that across generations. You know, your friend that you thought was had your back, you overhear their, their gossiping about you. And, you know, there's a whole range of this stuff. So to put it in sort of a clinical sense, this is one formulation of, of the problem. Evil and suffering exist in abundance. I don't think anyone would deny that. Therefore, God, if he exists, must either be limited, unable to stop evil, 
or evil himself. So either he's unable or unwilling, which makes him complicit, right? And since the Bible claims God is both all-powerful and, and loving, the Bible is false. So that's one way that down through the centuries people have grappled with this. And before I go on to give the biblical view and, and some consider some objections to it, I think it's important to note, I think we actually talked about this uh, in the discussion the first week of this series, this isn't just an issue for the biblical worldview. Uh, evil, as we would all agree, I think, regardless of our worldview, is a reality that we as humans all face. And so one more time back to this worldview grid, you know, if, if naturalism or atheism is true, this first column, very few, I think, would would say that it's okay to feed people into shredding machines alive. But if, if this view is actually true, then there's no basis for saying there's a qualitative difference between the arrangement of, of chemicals that make up a human being and, and minerals and everything else. We may feel that way, but it has no ground. There's, there's no basis for the oughtness that we all sense is true. Uh, with pantheism, the situation is actually maybe even worse because pantheism holds that everything is God and God is everything. And that's why the yin-yang symbol with the white and the black and the S curve and the little dot of each is, is conveying something very profound, which is that what we think of as the difference between good and evil is actually illusory. All is one, all is God, and that includes what we would call evil. And then when we look at the polytheistic nature religions, uh, these limited deities are usually worse than human beings. And finally, of course, what I've been arguing is the dominant worldview in our culture for the last several generations, the idea that spiritual truth is just a, a preference. There is no such thing as, as truth in the sense that we tend to use the word. Well, here now we're required to agree with, at some level, everybody's view of what's right and what's wrong, including the people feeding human beings into shredding machines or running the Auschwitz gas chambers, etc., etc. So at one level, every one of these alternative views requires us to, to sort of accommodate or accept evil. So while I agree that Evil represents a particular challenge to the biblical worldview of a personal, infinite, loving God. What I want to argue, what I've found in my own investigation here, is that it's the biblical worldview that is the only one that has a basis for hope in the face of evil. It's very different. So with that, let me, let me try to describe from a, a passage that I very much enjoy. The biblical view of evil, pull out some points and we'll consider the implications. I think a great place to go is one of the most famous stories that Jesus told, often called the parable of the prodigal son. And uh, let's just dive into it and we'll pull some points out. Jesus is telling the story because he is being accused of hanging out with disreputable evil people. And so rather than respond directly, he tells this, he tells this story. And it's one of the many, many places where you get sort of a beautiful little encapsulation of the whole message of biblical Christianity. So Jesus said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of the estate that falls to me. Now, of course, in this culture, this was a profound insult, deeply disrespectful. Basically, the, the, the son is saying, I'm tired of waiting around for you to kick off. I want to have my money now so I can get out of here. <laughs> And the father relents. He divided his wealth between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered everything together and went on a journey into a distant country. And there he squandered his estate with loose living. We get some details of what that was, not so different than as now. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine occurred in that country and he began to be in need. And he went and attached himself to one of the citizens of that country, and he sent him into his fields to, to feed swine. And he was longing to fill his stomach with the pods that the swine were eating, and no one was giving anything to him. So Jesus' Jewish audience would have been slightly nauseated at this point because pigs are ritually unclean. And if you've ever seen pigs fed, it's not a pretty sight. 
So this guy, having gotten his wish to get away from his father and get out and live life, things are not going well. And he comes to his senses and he says, how many of my father's hired men have more than enough bread, but I'm dying here with hunger. I will get up and go to my father and I'll say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired men. And he got up and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the, the father just interrupts him in the middle of his little speech turns to the servants, quickly bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, and bring the fattened calf, kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost and has been found. And they began to have a party. <laughs> it's such a rich little story. So many uh, levels in it. Uh, again, I think it encapsulates kind of the whole biblical Christian message that the father is God and the son is humanity feeling like I just need to get away from this tyrant. I need to get out and live life on my own resources and have a good time, have a good party. And it turns out that in the distant country, it's not a good time. It's not a party. I love the little detail that the father sees him. You get the impression. I always get the impression of sort of a farmhouse looking out over a valley with a long road. And the, the father's waiting to see this moment when his son will come back to him. And, and where's the party? Well, the, <laughs> the party is back with the father. So it's a beautiful little encapsulation of the whole thing. But I think there's some points we can pull out here about the biblical view of evil. So let's pull a few things. First of all, the Bible affirms that evil is evil, and that sounds a little silly, but again, this is, this is a profound difference. In, in the biblical worldview, we have a ground floor, we have a logical basis for our intuition that certain things just ought not to be. It's not just that we don't like them, it's not that a majority of people disagrees with them, there's something more. Moral language requires this foundation. The reason it's wrong to feed people alive into a shredding machine is because the ground floor ethic of respect for persons has a basis in the biblical worldview. They are created in the image of God. It's wrong to do that or violate them in any other way. So evil things, unlike the alternative views, have a real basis. Our intuition has a place to land, but there's more here than that. And this I have found so helpful over the years as I've been following Christ. It's not just that particular things are evil, but that the whole world, the whole reality we inhabit today is in a broken and an abnormal state. And you get this from the fact in the story that there's the father's house where people treat each other a certain way and things are done a certain way. And then there's the distant country where things go very differently where people use each other for their own selfish ends. And when they're done using them, like this guy, when his money ran out, no one wants to, to show any love to him at all. And so this is the biblical view, is that we are living in a reality where humans have been given the option to go to the distant country to basically invite God out of this current situation, and, th and that things are abnormal. And this is really profound. So we see things like this in Galatians 1.4. Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us out of this present evil age. The whole thing is evil. The whole thing is the distant country where things are not running the way God will eventually want them to run when it, again, is his house. Boy, I think Christians miss this sometimes. Have you ever talk to somebody, you talk about a bad day, you know, a flat tire or you know, something worse happened, and they're like, huh, uh, maybe God's trying to teach you something. I remember reading the book of Job and finally figuring out what's going on there for the first time. Job's friends were that way, right? Job's friends are saying, boy, all this terrible stuff happened to you, dude. You must have done something really wrong for this to happen. And the Bible, I'm so thankful to say, says, no, 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 no. No, this is an unjust 
deeply evil, abnormal situation, even nature, the natural realm, in some, some extent, has been impacted by this. So I think that is super helpful. And as I've gone on, like I said, really understanding that, I think maybe that's why it's such an early teaching in the Bible. The third chapter introduces this notion of the fall. And then, of course, the, the, the main biblical response to this challenge, you know, how can an all-powerful God be loving in the light of all this evil? Well, in the story, there's one thing, right, that the father wanted more than to protect his son from all of the harm and suffering in the distant country. What is that one thing? Well, I think it's pretty clear. The one thing the father wanted, even more than protecting his son from pain, was to have a love relationship with his son, and that entails the freedom to choose for or against that relationship. He could lock his son up uh, and, and, you know, keep those bad things from happening, but that would, that would foreclose the option of a love relationship. And so that's what the father was holding out for. And that is what we see, I think, in the Bible. Here's Jesus as he's heading into Jerusalem on the week that he's going to be arrested and crucified and raised from the dead. He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. So God is honoring uh, the choices corporately and individually, and our choices impact each other. Uh, because what he wants is ultimately relationship. This is the biblical diagnosis, both the small level and large scale evil in the world. Like this passage says, what's the source of quarrels and wars? Uh, I think that's a better translation. Uh, small scale quarrels and big scale disasters among you is not the source your pleasures that wage war in your members. You want something and you don't have it, so you commit murder. You're envious and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You don't have because you do not ask. So here in the distant country, we're all, you know, billions and billions of our own gods with finite resources trying to make a life apart from the one who we are created to live in relationship with. And just to put a bit of a logical point on this, my, my uh, good friend, atheist, said, well, you know, that doesn't really help. God could just create free will be beings that always chose the right thing. And so I think this is playing with language here. <laughs> this is what I, my response was. It's like saying God can make a four-legged tripod. Well, that's a definitional problem. Or, you know, you can talk about elections in Cuba. Uh, you can call them elections, but, but there's certain logical implications there that, that aren't present. Uh, there's a story that somebody asked Martin Luther, can God make a rock so big that he can't move it? And Martin Luther's response was, no, he's too busy making hell for people that ask questions like that. I think a better response would have been, look, you're, you're using language in a nonsensical way. If God's going to give personal beings the, the option, and in the beginning of the, of the Bible is very clear that he he goes out of his way to make sure that there, there is an option, then that's going to entail the possibility that those personal beings can choose evil. And I think that is the core of the, the biblical response. There's one more aspect that isn't in the little parable that I read, and it, that is that God will eventually eliminate evil, and I think this is important too. One of my favorite passages near the end of the whole Bible talks about a new heaven and a new earth. The heaven and first earth passed away, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, the dwelling place of God is among men. He shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall no longer be any death. There shall no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So not only is the current state abnormal from what God wants, caused by God giving us individually and corporately the option to uh, wander off from him, but eventually God will end it. When I look at this, I, I feel like as I've lived my life and dealt with the impact of evil in various ways, 
it's it's a a real workable solution. I remember when our our twins were born three months early, and back then that was very very difficult to survive, and they had a lot of problems, and it didn't look like they were going to survive. As it turned out. Uh, they're doing great, which we're grateful for. But but when things were really dark, I remember somebody came up to me and said, what do you think God's trying to teach you through this? And drawing on the biblical worldview, and in particular this grid through which we can look at evil, I said, I'm not sure he's trying to teach me anything. The biblical position is that this what we see around us is not God micromanaging getting back at people and, and so forth, what we see is profound injustice from his standpoint. He's got a reason for it, and he's going to ultimately remedy it. So having said that, I don't believe, for me, maybe you're thinking the same thing. It quite answers all the questions, and I'm, I'm not going to claim to do that as well tonight, but there are two in particular I want to close with that occurred to me. One is, okay, so God loves us, and that entails giving us choice, and if we make the wrong choices, then evil can flow from that. I get that. But why doesn't God just at some point step in and say enough is enough? You know, when you read history, you just think, <laughs> how could God just st sit there and watch this, even knowing all that we just covered? And uh, there's a couple of thoughts, a couple of responses to this. I think it's very easy for us as humans to think, well, I know where that line would be. Do we want God to, to intervene when anything evil is done? I think generally we would think, well, people that are really, really bad, well, what about those things where, you know, people are, are doing those more low-level acts of selfishness that end up reverberating around and injuring people? What about the things that we do like that, right? C.S. Lewis said, If God intervened at midnight tonight to eliminate all evil, where would you and I be at 1201? And so this is kind of back to the biblical grid here, is that when God does evaluate, he doesn't evaluate based on my preferences or my convenience. He evaluates from his own perspective that all humans are innately valuable, and any injury to them in thought, word, and deed is a serious issue. So here's the picture as it, it's presented to me. and see what you think about it. This verse is in 2 Peter. It says, The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to a change of mind. So, So this is... One bit of what God seems to be thinking is it grieves him and horrifies him, and he will eventually fix it. But right now, his main priority is appealing to each and every human being through a variety of means to say, look, you can come back to me, and you can escape this present evil age by reconciliation with me, and in the age to come, you'll be with me forever. That's his priority. And so he's not eager to draw the line. I think there's a bit more of a mystery to it, and we can talk about this if you want at the end with some questions. I don't want to take too long tonight, but this passage is interesting. Jesus is talking about the end of this current age, and he says, unless those days had been cut short, no life would have been saved. And so how long is God going to let it go on? He's going to get it, let it go on apparently until the absolute last second when humanity is finally on the verge of destroying themselves ourselves and then he'll say that's that's it so that helps me maybe it helps you i don't know and there's one more question though and that is this the god of the bible is not a mechanical force uh, the god of the bible is a person meaning that the personal decision to create was not mechanical it was not coerced the god of the bible is utterly sovereign and self-existent. The God of the Bible did not need us to relate to. <laughs> and so, so this one question remains in my mind. Okay, God knows the future, and so he knows about Auschwitz, and he knows about all these lower-level things that go on in our lives. And yet, he, for, he was not coerced. 
he freely chose to create anyway. So why did he create? And I think in, in that sense, yes, God's on the hook, because otherwise he wouldn't be the God described to us in the Bible. And I'm not aware of a direct answer to this question, but I'll share where I've landed. I think that God's response to this question is to assert that he acted ultimately out of love. You know, you've got statements like 1 John, God is love. Everything that he does is just and loving. And you've got Jesus' statement of purpose, I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. So the question I want to end with is, <laughs> why should we trust God's goodness in the light of evil? I think this is God's response is, rather than directly answering it, he wants to persuade us to trust him. And how does he do that? Well, there are a variety of ways you read through the Bible and you'll see God making this case over and over again, trying to persuade us ultimately to trust in his goodness and love. So here's the, the primary event, though, I think that he points to is this crux of the whole thing, which is the Messiah, God himself, entering human history and dying on the cross. And so in Romans 5, Paul says, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, which is me and all of us. Then he says, by analogy, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So yeah, some people do throw themselves on a grenade to save their buddies. It happens. You feel like you died to, to save your kids. But how about for people that really couldn't care less about you or even had an enmity in their minds toward you? This act of love was done while we were actively disregarding trying to fence God out of our lives. And uh, what actually happened on the cross, when we think about that and really understand a bit of the biblical depth there, uh, really underlines this. Here's a verse that uh, I think about sometimes, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. God made him, that is Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So it wasn't just physical death, right? What was happening on the cross is this switch of identities, which is great news for us, that we can, as a gift, have an utterly clean conscience but what a cost for Christ. I don't believe we can ever get to the bottom of what that really cost him. Probably I'm not the only one that has memories that when they come up in my mind, something I did or said or should have done or should have said that I wince and wish I could take it back. And that, that sense of shame and that sense of guilt, I think are a dim, dim, tiny reflection of what this must have been like for Jesus as he sat there and said to God in the garden, you know, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Because he had to become all of the evil of humanity. And so this often misunderstood uh, statement near the end on the cross when Jesus cried out and said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is because, of course, he's quoting the Psalm 22, which predicts details of the crucifixion from 900 years prior. <clears throat> but <clears throat> it is literally true that God the Father has forsaken him, and Jesus is standing in for us so that we don't have to face that. And so Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. I think what God is saying to us here is, look, um, evil is terrible, and you may wonder how I can be good uh, given some of the things that come into our lives or some of the things that we see. And I think his primary response is to direct our attention here and say, if, if this doesn't persuade you that I'm trustworthy and that I'm ultimately good and this is you're ultimately going to see how this all works out, then I don't know what else I can do. So that's kind of where I land on uh, the problem of evil. I find it actually really kind of motivating to look through this and think through this and contrast the biblical response to it to the alternatives that we have as humans. I'm going to wrap up with just a couple of points on the whole 
this whole, how many weeks, seven weeks we've been going through this stuff. This is my own investigation that I've been sharing with you guys. And uh, this summarized my findings that the Bible's unique in its emphasis on this notion of grace, that it's not about human morality, human penance, human spiritual discipline or insight. It's about God's initiative at his own expense to give us an unmerited gift. Charis, that's what grace means. Uh, there are hints of that in other religious and philosophical systems, but the Bible's the only organized presentation both of the infinite personal God and this notion of grace. And coupled with that, some other unique factors that I was super grateful to find my way to is that the Bible harmonizes with and I think is supported by science and actually does have uh, empirically verifiable pieces of evidence, objectively verifiable evidence for these claims that are so difficult for us to directly verify and encourages us to think through those things. So a reasonable basis for Christianity but where we want to end briefly is, so what? <laughs> this isn't just for enjoyable philosophical talk, which I do, hopefully some of you do as well, but there's a point to it. And I, I would summarize the so what this way, come back to the Father's house, right? That, that little picture, I think, is something to visualize with each of us individually and God, God sitting on the porch, letting us go, longing for the day we change our minds and we'll just want to come back. It's not a geographical journey like it was for the sun in the story. It's even simpler than that. It is a change of mind wherever you are just privately. You can make this decision to come back and you can be assured based on the Bible that you're going to meet the same kind of awesome response that the sun got. You know, it's easy to think, well, I might do that, but, you know, he wouldn't want me back after what I've done and what I'm doing right now. The Bible says, no, that's not true. He would throw a party for you, and he will. And so to put as fine a point on it as I can, what, what is God looking for? Coming back to the Father's house means expressing what the Bible calls faith, which is not, as I hope you can see by now, blind faith, like believing something that you know is not true. The Bible rejects that. But neither is it simple, passive, intellectual assent. Yeah, okay, maybe I, maybe I believe that God exists and Jesus maybe it was who he said he is. That It's more than that. It resides in the will. It is a personal decision to actively trust Christ based on reasonable evidence, but it's much more than reaching an intellectual conclusion. And so, you know, people talk about becoming a Christian it's not by good works. You don't have to give up your weed or, or whatever else. God has already covered everything that we have done and will do, but it requires a decision on our part to express faith in Christ at a moment in time. And so it's a little bit like responding to a proposal of marriage by saying yes. And you can say it in your own heart, in your own words. The Bible says it a lot of different ways. The prayer that I think I started with and a lot of friends of mine did has some doubt in it, right? You can say things like, I'm not really sure if this is true, but a part of me senses it might be. And, and if it is, I want to know. And if it is, I want in. And I think that that's, that's the kind of faith response that uh, God's looking for to begin the relationship that will continue for eternity. Jesus says it this way, to receive him, to welcome him, right? As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who trust in his name. So, so there we are, investigating Christianity, and uh, I love questions, and if you got some that occur to you later and you want to email me, I got my email up on the screen there, and I will stop sharing and See if people have questions. So, Doug, I think you and I have talked about this before, but I think, like, all of this stuff about, like, people hurting each other with the problem of evil, I can kind of sort of get behind. But the part that, like, gets more difficult for me is disease and, like, horrible, like, natural occurring things that mm -hmm. happen. What are your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, like the cat plan with mice that I started with from Darwin. Yeah, yeah nature. Uh, that's why I included that. I think that's when I see carnivorality, it, it, it bothers me a lot. Right. And and so what I see in the Bible is that when things went off the rails, there was a ripple effect. And part of that is in nature itself. If you really want to go a couple of layers down, I believe that the biblical picture is that there was already evil uh, due to rebellion against God by the time of the creation of the world and the universe, the physical universe. And uh, Romans 8 makes the interesting comment that all of creation has been subject to futility and will re be redeemed later. And you see pictures of this in Isaiah, beautiful passages where carnivorality will stop, right? And that, that the whole way that nature operates, including natural disasters, but not, but even the, the basic way everything works, even when it's not a disaster, right, is sort of problematic. Death, right, that we experienced from our little kitty buddy this week. I mean, all of that sucks. And that's not even a, a great natural disaster. But when you read about the new heaven and the new earth, it's not going to be that way. Another good passage is John 9, right? A natural disaster on a, on a personal level, like I was born blind. And they're like, whose fault was that? The guy or his parents? And Jesus rejects both theories, right? The, the whole thing is broken. God's not superintending it. Terrible things happen because we invited him out. And one of the things that's being portrayed is, this is what it's like when God is not on the throne. 